Chris Hughes from the Diocese of Hexham in Newcastle. <coughs> you have beautifully outlined the humanity of these people. And yet, the press and government um, are doing their best to, to show us that, to try and convince us they haven't got a humanity. How can we ensure to change people's perceptions so they can see the, 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 the beautiful humanity of these people? Thanks, Chris. Can we hear yours, Liam? Hi, uh, Liam Purcell, <coughs> Chair of Action on Poverty. Um, we ran a campaign called Living Ghosts for a long time, trying to challenge the government policies that were led to destitution and churches speaking out. And in about 2010, we ran out of money and had to stop and haven't been able to work on it since in that way. And we hadn't achieved very much, and that was under the new Labour government, and things have only got worse, I would say, since. So are you able to give us any hope of, or, or vision of how we could actually challenge the policies and what hope is of changing the, the structures that are causing the problems? I'd be interested to hear about that. Thank you. Those two questions sit very nicely together. Do, now, is this microphone on? Yes, okay. Um, I mean, I think they're in a way that they're part and parcel of the same issue, although there are kind of wider questions about how you can challenge perceptions. I mean, I, I think that there's always a danger when we look at the, the big structural issues that we get so overwhelmed by the scale of the awfulness of it that we lose sight of the fact that sometimes there are really ordinary things that everybody can do that can make a difference. And that then, so I suppose before I start to talk about the structural issues, which I'll go on to do in a minute, I want to say that that what each individual person can do in terms of the way in which they um, witness to the humanity of asylum seekers, and indeed, I'm sorry, not the only people in society who are demonised, but they are particularly um, uh, aggressively demonised at, at the moment. But just, just your action is as important as words. And, and I think that that's something that I've learned particularly in my work at JRS, and um, maybe it's a surprising thing for a former politician to say who, who'd, um, who'd been so focused on the importance of words. And I think when I last spoke here, I seem to recall that most of what I spoke about, partly because I was so frustrated with the state of public discourse was about the impact of words. I'm pretty sure that was my uh, address back in 2013 or 14 or whatever it was when I last came. But, but actions are another way of witnessing, and, um, and not everybody is able, for all sorts of reasons, to engage with the bigger structural problems um, uh, to do with your own life, or what the position you're in, or what time you have, or your own abilities. But um, accompanying people, what you say to individuals, what you say to other people in your church, what you say to other people in your community, and what you do and what you demonstrate by what you do also makes a difference. And it's heard by and experienced by refugees. It is experienced by them. What the Cardinal did in being alongside people in our day centre was heard and experienced by people in our day centre. I'm also thrilled he then went on to the BBC and said that it was a shame, <laughs> that the asylum system was a shame on our country. I was just delighted to hear him say that. Um, but he also had a profound impact on the people that he met by what he did. So I just frame that first. Um, in terms of the, the kind of bigger structural issues, and Liam, I have huge sympathy with you on um, the difficulty around getting funding, particularly to campaign on this. We've seen all sorts of different organisations grow and then collapse um, because of funding working on destitution. And in the last couple of years, it, it's become really difficult. I, Steve tells me that um, uh, one of the uh, uh, speakers yesterday spoke about precarity and the kind of precariousness of people's lives. The truth is that an awful lot of the organisations that serve those people whose lives are really precarious are themselves precarious. Um, they, so you end up with your, you kind of incarnate the situation that you are attempting to respond to. Um, because of the difficulty in, in gaining funding. We are in a very privileged position that the Jesuits give us enough support that we are stable. Um, and we're very conscious of that and understand our need to serve the wider church. And it's the reason why we've 
invested some of our resources in policy and in communications and advocacy so that we can support others. We know that we are not the only faith-based organisation that works to support destitute asylum seekers. There's, there's Revive, for example, up in Manchester, there's St Chad's in Birmingham, and we're really lucky that we actually have some policy capacities to try and do that. So we know that that, that is, um, it is a duty, if you like, on us to be able to do that. I also think we need to start getting together um, and getting organisations together as much as possible to share experience um, and see what we are able to do. I have a sense that there is a kind of window at the moment. Um, although um, the government has done its best to close down the debate around Windrush so that it, it is somehow a kind of minor aberration um, and rebranded as the compliance agenda a few things have been stopped, a bit of data sharing has been temporarily halted. They've been doing their best to close it down, um, and Brexit is fairly effectively distracting all other attention at the moment. Um, but I think there's a window. It's the first time in five years I've seen the Home Office on the retreat on its aggressive um, uh, practices, the first time. So I think there is a moment, there is a moment when it is possible, for, and the public are still listening, and it is possible for people to begin to make some of those, some of those arguments. Okay. Two questions, three questions. Uh, can we hear these three? Start with Pat, and then David, and then Kim, to your... To your right with the mic, just there. So Pat first. Yes, Pat Gaffney from Pax Christie. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, and it's good that I think what I, I want to say picks up. One of the things you just said is that we have to be better at working together. And I share that frustration. And to me, one of the issues in relation to migration and asylum has to be the issue of war and conflict because it's Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya and Syria and they're the poor people who are coming to our shores and the ones who are filling the countries on their borders. Um, and it seems that we're all very tentative about making these connections between domestic issues and policies that have an international implication and yet they're so tightly bound together. We can't not talk about the arms trade and its impact on war and fueling conflict. And yet, <coughs> we find it, as Pax Christi, very difficult to get our churches and communities making that joined up thinking and that, that connection. Not expecting JRS to do it or someone else, but to just make the connection and in the analysis of looking at what's happening, what are the causes, what are the push factors, to see that actually it brings it back home. And right. that also needs attention here, as well as the care and the shelter. Before we hear David's question, would you like to do a yeah, quick sort of list? I, I, I also think um, it's not just an issue of war and conflict, it's also the impact of climate change, of course, which also feeds into war and conflict, because lack of resources is such an important issue around, um, around war. But people also migrate um, simply because of lack of water and lack of resources. Um, extreme poverty is another reason why people are forced to migrate, and it's not recognised in the conventions, but Catholic social teaching has always had a history of recognising that people have become, if you like, de facto refugees. They are, um, they are, um, they, 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 they are forced to migrate in exactly the same way for a whole range of different reasons. And so that kind of joined up thinking and of understanding our impacts and the wider impact of our actions on, um, on others is, is really important. It's really difficult to make those kind of arguments at the moment because we're retreating ever more behind a kind of national identity that, that seeks to pretend that we have no impact abroad um, and that others abroad can have no impact on us. I mean, I think it's, I think it's even more difficult at the moment to make those kind of arguments, but I, I agree with you, Pat. Perhaps that's a piece of work for somebody to pick up after mm -hmm. this. So, David. Yeah. Here comes the mic. Um, 
Hello, Sarah. Um, David McLaughlin from Newman University of Learning. Very sorry that I missed your talk, but I heard it was brilliant. <laughs> that's very kind. In fact, everybody frightened me to death. They said you'd never follow them. No, that's what happened to me last time. Um, do, um, I don't know quite how to look up past this question, but it's partly because you have knowledge as a uh, former MP, but do you think there's something wicked about asking civil servants and another agents to do something that is both inadequate and clearly dishonest in the assessment of these people and with a certain certain amount of evidence that they've got to meet quotas. Now, so there's a sort of serious question about a government, uh, or, you know, a government requiring its workers to do something that is dishonest. And, and I mean, have you any evidence for what the people who have to do this work actually feel about all of this? I mean, I know one person who resigned from the civil service because of this work, because of the sheer, what he thought was his wickedness. Thank you. I mean, I think if we're looking for evidence of how people feel, the fact that we know that there is such high turnover in caseworkers, that um, every attempt to get on top of the backlog results in um, getting further and further behind, I think tells you quite a lot about the morale of those who work inside the Home Office doing this kind of work. And um, I mean, I, I have no personal evidence. I only have what I, ha I see in terms of um, what happens to people um, and the reports and the inquiries which are public information. Uh, so there was there was somebody who'd been a caseworker who did a, an expose for The Guardian maybe six weeks ago, I can't remember exactly when it was. It was quite, it was quite recent. Um, and they spoke about it being a little bit like being in a, a, a kind of um, telesale centre with, with targets that they had to meet, that they were forced to um, jump through um, hoops to make decisions very quickly. And they were dealing with people whose cases were complicated and distressing that they felt unsupported in dealing with what was actually is extremely traumatic material for them to deal with. There have been previous, um, in, previous inquiries and investigations that have noticed that they often use very junior and trained staff, often very young, who don't feel prepared and able and emotionally capable of dealing with what they are seeing. There have been plenty of other stories about being given Marks and Spencer's vouchers as an incentive to get appeals lost when people go to um, try and get their um, appeal. So if, they, if the Home Office manages to win an appeal and gets an asylum seeker, there was a, a story about people being given vouchers. There's, there's a lot of this, this stuff, is, it, it percolates up and, and unfortunately that shocks. It, it kind of makes sense of, of, of what people who work with asylum seekers are seeing and that some of the decisions are baffling. And they obviously have not been, no care has been taken, you know, great chunks of stuff get sent back on letters that is clearly somebody else's information and it's as if nobody's read the papers or gone through the detail. Um, so it, it makes sense of what we know, um, but I personally don't know it. Is, it. is it wicked, you said? Well, I mean, it clearly is wrong to ask somebody to do something you know yourself to be morally wrong. The civil servants are not the only people who are placed in this position. That the, the nature of the change in the way in which immigration enforcement is being done is to involve more and more and more people in society in the job of immigration enforcement. So landlords being required to check somebody's immigration status before they give them somewhere to live involves civilians who are, you know, in every possible way, have nothing to do with immigration enforcement in the job of immigration enforcement. Universities are required to check this kind of information. Um, the health service is now required to check people's information and to bill people, even though they never have any chance of paying it. And what it means if you can't pay it is that you get a black mark against your possibility of sorting out your immigration status. So you get into this web of horror very easy to fall into the pit in this system. The system is set up to enable you to fail and get yourself into a hole that you can't clamber out of. That's the whole way in which 
the system appears to be designed. <coughs> Hello, can you speak? Oh. Jim Barnwell. Oh, I can't hear. Jim Barnwell from uh, Caritas Archdiocese Cardiff in development. Uh, last year, in the run up to the Pope's uh, First World Day of the Poor, uh, First World Day of the Poor, as opposed to before the poor, we were asked to encounter people, to meet with them, to really meet with them. And uh, of course, a lot of your presentation and many other presentations we have are about the organisational way in which we engage with these matters. But I want to consider the idea of the relational way. It's important for us all in our parishes, in our groups and communities, to start to learn how to encounter and to deeply listen, not only to the words, but the feelings of people. Do you think that Pope Francis's call, which I think is a universal call, and certainly not just the Catholics, is an important new way for us to engage alongside our organizational way of challenges, challenging these things? Because it strikes me that as a single organization, we fight policy, but if the people start to fight policy, with the organisations that it strikes me we might get changed. What do you think? I mean, I, I think... Come on. Uh, we yeah. have about two minutes. Oh, right, okay. So. Mm, okay. <laughs> um, it might take me longer than two minutes to deal with all of that, so um, maybe I should just say yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I'm a kind of <coughs> profound convert to um, the this idea of encounter in a kind of deep way of really meeting people and really listening to people and the way in which it changes your perspective um, and, and it, that conversion happened to me in small ways as an MP um, my first advice surgery when I was first elected back in 2003 I remember listening to the first story and realising that most of the people in the queue were experiencing what I'm now doing, um, people who were struggling to get their asylum case um, resolved and who were living in various stages of destitution. And for me that was, it, I remember it just feeling like I, I don't, had some kind of conversion experience of there was all this out there, I had no idea, this level of injustice, how could this possibly be true? I think you learn something which is true and you learn something about human beings and you learn something about um, human dignity um, in its rawest and most real sense by really listening to what somebody is experiencing um, and it can't <coughs> change you and then there has to be an action on the back of that in some way um, and that's for another time.